So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's seminar. Today we have Adam Schultz talking about faster, lighter, cheaper, developing new instrumentation to broaden access to MT. And Adam just told me that he will introduce his bio because it, it's, it's relevant for what he's going to talk about um, during his talk. So I will uh, skip that for now, but I also want to remind you about the upcoming seminars of the next few weeks. So if the screen lets me, yeah, next week we have Roman Corseri on 3D, 3D magnetotelluric image of a hyperextended and serpentinized rift system in the southwest barren sea margin. That's going to be at three universal time. Um, then in two weeks time on the 2nd of March at a sort of slightly unusual time for our EMINARs from Australia, Janelle Simpson on using um, MT to understand the Mount Isa province. So those of you maybe for this is for who this is a bit early, that should be a convenient time. On the 9th, early again, uh, we have Ian Ferguson on nuts and bolts of magnetotelluric instrumentation and fieldwork. And then the final one in this preview on the 16th of March, even earlier than this time slot, Raphael Rocklitz on CUSDM from open source 3DM modeling towards inversion. Ah, there's one more, sorry. Uh, 23rd of March, Simon Jowit on mining for net zero. So that's a bit beyond the typical MT uh, EM realm that we're talking about. And with that short introduction, I assume that you are all familiar with the um, website where you can look at the videos of past presentations and look at the registration link. And a final uh, reminder, this is a webinar. Please post your questions in the question and answers um, box, not in the chat because there it gets sort of lost too easily. Um, so far, it always has worked very well that we, we postponed questions to the end and there's no real time limit. So don't, don't worry that you won't be able to ask your question. And uh, what I will do is I will read out the question uh, so that's in the record. And remember, this is going to be recorded and then Adam can answer that question. So we have both the question and answer as an audio um, archive. And I think, with that, I will hand over to Adam to introduce himself and talk about cheap MT instrumentation. Okay, thank you. And let me get the screen share underway. Yeah. And let's get it started. If you could confirm the size is good and everyone can this see is it. Great. Yeah, looks good. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Max. Uh, for those who know me a little bit or may be alarmed that I'm wearing this uh, horrible device around my neck, I had some uh, surgery in September that takes quite a while to recover from. So uh, do not be alarmed. Uh, I may take it off later. If my head falls off, it was a bad call. But in any event, here we go. Uh, so the, the theme today really is how do we broaden access to MT? How do we lower the cost of admission? How do we make our uh, operations more efficient? How do we uh, make it just so compelling uh, a method that uh, it expands and is used for, for all the many critical things? I particularly liked um, Alan Jones's um, BC Geophysical Society uh, talk I, I attended where the theme was really, if we're going to decarbonize the economy, uh, paradoxically it means a, a major expansion in um, geophysical exploration for all of the materials needed uh, for that process. So uh, let's, let's think about that. How do we make this much easier for people getting into the, into the game? Uh, and uh, my co-authors are Brady Fry and Taylor Vitti, who are with me in the National Geoelectromagnetic Facility at Oregon State University. Uh, four items. The first one is more of a personal bio. Uh, it's, it, it kind of sets the tone uh, and it really tries to explain from somebody of my generation, you know, the, the old people looking out the window a little bit, how high the price of admission really was to the MT club and how it's impractical now for people coming through to have to 
become masters of everything. So I'll talk about that, the evolution of MT instrumentation and technique through my own personal perspective. I'm, I'm gonna start at the beginning and then talk about some of the issues that have come up in the years running increasingly large 3D um, MT and related uh, surveys and how we can kind of detect and mitigate against inefficiencies that drag the process out, raise costs and uh, lead to frustration overall. And then really specifically, what are the barriers to more wide scale adoption of MT and TM? Uh, EM methods. And finally, a, a, a solution that we're developing right now that we think will contribute to this. So let's let's talk about this, you know, baby boomer generation, right? We've got a bunch of people here who are in kind of my, my demographic. And, you know, if you're lucky, aging happens and it's inevitable. If you're not lucky, it doesn't. But I got to tell you, looking at this, there are not, not a lot of great advantages necessarily to aging, but sometimes uh, you manage to get in at something if not at the beginning, close enough to the beginning to really make it interesting. So I'm gonna like, go back. I was a kid in New York City. And one of the experiences I had was a National Science Foundation funded uh, summer program where you're teamed with uh, a professor in a university, in this case, City University of New York. And I was really into astronomy at that point, which is weird for a kid from New York City. Um, but I had this idea about, uh, the impact of high densities of micro -meteor meteoroids in the upper atmosphere somehow impacting uh, production of secondary cosmic rays. So I thought I need to build a cosmic ray telescope. So I worked with this uh, professor using scintillation counters and, and iodide crystal um, detectors and coincidence counters to, to build this device, collected a bunch of data during the largest uh, meteor shower of the year and, and then learned some statistics and thought, well, I got to figure out how to do this. So this is the first kind of sciencey thing I, I really built in, in earnest. And this was 1974, I think. And so I, I learned Fortran 4. And we had a teletype terminal that was linked to a mainframe somewhere else in New York City. And uh, you coded onto paper tape. And then when you had your program, you couldn't make any mistakes. You'd feed the paper tape through the teletype and it would run on this mainframe and then spew back printed copy on the teletype paper. Um, and, you know, that was really cool, right? It was fun. I got to use big toys and I was doing sciencey things. So that was very engaging. You know, STEM activities for high schoolers, we, we, we like them now. They're very important. Uh, in college, so I went to, I went to Brown uh, University and I was determined to be an astrophysicist. So this was in 1975. I was one of 250 entering physics students that year. Two of those students graduated with physics degrees, right? It was uh, kind of selective. So pretty soon, I'd say about a year and a half in, I realized I was basically too stupid to be a Brown University astrophysicist. And I was, uh, you know, looking around to find a track. And I also had a job because Brown was super expensive. It was something like $6,000 a year, you know, back then, which was unbelievable. And so I had to work and I worked as an assistant operator of an IBM 360-67 mainframe computer. It was a central computer. It had a dedicated building, all right? Took the whole building for the computer. I remember we had one of the largest main memories, RAM memories in the world at the time. It was a megabyte and it took an entire room for one megabyte of hand wound ferrite core memory. And it was also the world's first virtual machine. So it was really a good experience learning how these things worked. And uh, I started taking like courses and there was a, an introductory course called the geology of Mars, moon and the earth. That was phenomenal. Taught by somebody very big in, in lunar uh, work for NASA, Jim Head. And then I managed to talk myself into a graduate course on the geology of Mars. In 1976, when the Viking landers had just landed on Mars, and the professor, Tim Butch, was head of the imaging team for Viking. And we got to telex commands to Jet Propulsion Lab, to set filters on Viking. And we got photos and it was an amazing course. So I was determined. I was going to go into uh, comparative planetology as a career track. But the problem is the Apollo program had just ended. And basically everyone was saying, you're crazy. There are no jobs in this. Nobody cares about space anymore. So that was frustrating. And I was looking around and I saw this thing on a bulletin board. 
in the Department of Geological Sciences advertising for student employment for something called a geophysical technician, which is something I had no idea what it was, but it mentioned traveling to New Mexico, which sounded better than sticking around in Providence, Rhode Island in the summer. So I, I went for it and got it. And many of you on the older crowd will remember John Francis Hermance. So I worked for Jack Hermance and this was in 77. I was hired among other undergraduates working with a graduate student named Jens Peterson. Some of you may remember. And we did a couple of things. First of all, before going out to New Mexico, we built our own wideband MT system from scratch. Uh, and wideband MT, right? High frequencies, 1977. There really aren't any precision high speed electronic digitizers really yet that you can, you can take out into the field. So it's an analog system. And in order to analyze the data, we had to build an analog computer, which I'll, I'll talk about very briefly. We also did long period MT work, analog system. The long period systems recorded electric and magnetic fields, pen on paper using strip chart recorders. And then I had to hand digitize those. So I wasn't doing high frequency sampling. And then I had to key those values into this computer in, this, in the screen here, which was a very early transportable computer built by Tektronix, the oscilloscope people called the 4051. And on this computer, which had an eight bit, one megahertz Motorola 6800, uh, CPU. I think we had the deluxe model, not the eight kilobyte RAM model, but the 32 kilobyte RAM model. And you would fill a 300 kilobyte cartridge with code. And I wrote code in the basic language to do all of the processing of the MT data that we key punched in all the way to impedances and, and all of that good stuff. And we had a, a field crew um, of Jens Peterson. Some of you may remember Rick Ehrenbard from that era guy named Jacques Lord. We did transect across Northern New Mexico and also into the Valles Caldera uh, where the hot dry rock project was, was running. So it was you know, tiny resources, but it was actually possible to do it if you were efficient. What were the long period instruments back then? The electrodes really primitive. They were porous ceramic filters, little pots built by the Adolf Kors company in Colorado, Adolf Kors is of course a huge um, beer manufacturer of watery transparent stuff that pretends to be beer and it's uh, filtered very heavily to get any sediment out of it. So we use those pots, copper rods, copper sulfate solution and pop them in the ground and you'd go out every two, three hours and top them up with more copper sulfate. Uh, EDA flux gate magnetometers by modern standards, these were appalling. Uh, they had noise levels, nearly three orders of magnitude uh, higher than the sort of flux gate you'd use today. Um, and of course, once again, strip charts, strip chart recorders. Uh, the various sensor lines came into a camper top in a pickup truck, much like this advertisement of the era. Uh, on the left, strip chart uh, device on the top of this slide. And uh, there they went. Squiggles on paper, had to tear the paper off and hand digitize. Uh, pretty pretty uh, horrible, actually. Now, we also did wideband. Squid magnetometers were coming into vogue then. If you're not familiar, those are the uh, uh, superconducting quantum interference devices. They're really uh, amazing sensors. They were coming into use. Problem is, we're in remote parts of northern New Mexico for extended periods of time in the mid-1970s, and getting that liquid hydrogen is a problem, so we couldn't do that. So we hand laminated strips of magnetically permeable material. We annealed them first by boiling them in liquid hydrogen, built them up, wound the coils, and they were our induction coils. And we thought they were just fine, but they were probably pretty bad actually. But anyway, that, that was the, the equipment. And uh, again, because you didn't have the kind of fast, precise digitizers, electronic digitizers that were fuel ready, uh, we did this in an analog way, which meant the signals were fed into basically custom circuits that were designed to do particular mathematical functions and to display the results on an oscilloscope screen. And that's how we did wideband in 77. Um, 
So, you know, why, why am I taking this trip down memory lane? Basically, I'm talking first about the price of admission to the MT club, because in the, in the mid seventies, it was amazingly high. <laughs> you had to know everything. You had to know how to do the electronics, how to do the algorithm development, how to do the coding, how to build and operate the equipment. Every aspect of it was, was required. So I'll, I'll wrap up my personal history in a few more slides, but that's, it turns out there have been improvements in a lot of this, but not everything. And, and the, the not everything part is still holding us up. So, all right, done with my university degree, get out of Brown with my geology, physics, maths uh, bachelorate. And I, I'd been working on a senior thesis where I was doing some uh, vertical magnetic dipole and developing a solution for a particular Honkel transform. And that was my senior work. And then actually Alan Shave was doing something in parallel and published a, a famous paper on that as well. So it was clearly a, a developing field. And I really wanted to get into marine CSEM. At that point, I was not so environmentally conscious. And I was thinking of tracking into the oil industry and, and minerals industry. Uh, and I thought marine CSEM would be the next big thing. This was in 78, 79. I uh, visited uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, met the incredible Charles S. Cox. J Cox. Uh, went to sea with him uh, before I'd finished my undergrad degree on the scientific shakedown cruise of a new ship, the New Horizon, with his new marine controlled source EM equipment. And we were going to go off to the East Pacific Rise and deploy it. And uh, the ship was defective. We hit an enormous storm and a ship was damaged actually. And we were lucky to get back into port. Um, but in any event, I then worked for him. Uh, it was sort of between college and grad school. Uh, and my job was really to code. So I was in the, what's now called the Walter Monk building at Scripps at IGPP. I worked for him where I coded the, the first uh, Marine CSEM analysis software in Fortran 77 on a mini computer called a Prime ahead of his first successful cruise to the East Pacific Rise. Um, and I, I, just as an aside, he was very influential in my early kind of instrumentation career because I was a close observer of what he was doing. And one of the uh, things I remember most clearly from Chip was uh, uh, remember to turn the thing on before you throw it over the side of the ship because he forgot <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I was doing that and then I got accepted to the PhD program up in Seattle. So I moved to the great north uh, in 79 or if you're Canadian in the south. And uh, there I was in Seattle. Um, those who know me often mistakenly think that John Booker was my, my advisor for my PhD. It was a complicated arrangement. He was the chairman of my committee. My actual advisor was a guy named Jimmy Larson and Jimmy was attached to the university through a, an adjoint appointment but he was actually at the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. And he was doing mantle conductivity work, believe it or not, for that agency. So uh, I had this arrangement. And that first year, I was actually supported by somebody named Stuart Smith, a seismologist who became president of IRIS. And he tried to turn me into a seismologist. Well, he failed. I don't really, uh, certainly then, I didn't really like seismology. I thought it was kind of boring. Uh, I kind of, I like it better now, you know, I, I like seismologists, do stuff with them, but I'm glad I'm not one of them. Uh, you know, it's a crowded field and let's face it, nobody understands EM, right? So you, you have, as I say here, you have magical powers and you can say whatever you want because nobody can, can argue with you except another MT person. Um, another formative experience was 1980. You know, I started there in 79 in the, in the autumn. And by March 1980, uh, Mount St. Helens was beginning to rumble. And uh, I actually worked with a grad student um, named Don Lever, and he and I happened to be changing films and paper and stuff down, down in this seismic network room where we saw these little earthquakes and figured out they were from St. Helens. And Don happened to have some borrowed seismometers from US Geological Survey, and we went off to Mount St. Helens and started planting them just in case something was going to happen. Um, but ultimately, John Booker and I deployed a borrowed MT system. This was the first digital one we got to use. It was a, had a 12-bit electronic digitizer that recorded data onto audio cassette tapes, a C-data recorder. Again, EDA flux gates, so not very good flux gates by modern standards. Not very good electrodes, but we got some data from Mount St. Helens pre-eruption 
And that was my first uh, AGU uh, product was an abstract for that. Then uh, moving along, I, I got, because my own thesis work was in global scale, like mantle conductivity using magnetic observatory data. I wanted to see if we could extend the method to magnetotellurics as well and get deep into the mantle, which meant pushing down past periods of maybe 100,000, 200,000 seconds and using you know, very stable arrays of electric, electric field dipoles uh, and good magnetometers. So uh, tested this idea out. Uh, city of Seattle is built along the side of this enormous lake, Lake Washington. Uh, Stuart Smith, uh, the seismologist I mentioned, had a lakefront property. And we borrowed some equipment from USGS, uh, an MT system. And then I put this uh, big triangular array of six silver silver chlorides into the lake with more than a kilometer of separation between them. And it worked. We were able to do a very effective, uh, very long period MT in the lake. OK, so did my thesis again, not MT, but related global conductivity modeling. And I also had to develop some software uh, for that. This was the era when we were moving from exclusively using mini computers and remote supercomputers of the day to the new, newly developed personal computer, uh, 83. And uh, I was able to get uh, first generation of that for my project and uh, running MS-DOS 1.0 from a local company right across the lake called Microsoft. And they had a Fortran compiler that ran on it, but there was no graphics library. So I, I wrote one. And it was a, uh, if you're really old, you'll know what a CalComp is. It was a CalComp compatible uh, graphics library and discovered people wanted it. So we started actually forming a little company um, with a partner and we started selling this thing, shrink wrapping it and distributing it all over the world. And my advisor got a little irritated at me, Jimmy Larson, because I was making money and not necessarily really focusing only on the glories of the deep mantle. And basically he told me you can get rich or get a PhD. And that's a choice I always regretted. <laughs> Money's good, wish I had more. Um, so funny enough though, having gone down that track, uh, we managed to develop a funding gap, uh, which was awkward. And so I needed to raise money outside of my research assistantship because we we're waiting on NSF to make a decision on funding. So I got a job with a, cath a cathodic protection survey company in the North Sea, where uh, they were doing the survey of the DC potential between the newly installed pipelines and platforms and risers throughout the North Sea that went between uh, basically Aberdeen or Peterhead, Scotland to Stavanger, Norway. Uh, and they discovered that as they connected to a riser and to a voltmeter on the ship, and they had another electrode on the bottom in a fish near the pipeline and they paid out more and more cable, they started getting these oscillations. And the more the separation between these two things, the bigger the oscillations got. And, you know, Jimmy Larson and I looked at this and went, you know, they contacted us, went, yeah, we know what that is. We went to the Yesdale Muir Observatory, got magnetograms, this is up in, in you know, Northern Scotland, and boom, it was clearly an inductive uh, signal. Uh, uh, you know, telluric currents in the North Atlantic channeling into the shallow North Sea, leading to enormous uh, voltage swings. So I, I uh, installed large arrays, uh, long electric dipole uh, sensors in the bottom of the North Sea around these platforms, brought them up onto the platforms, hooked them to strip chart recorders, hand digitized them, and spent three months living on this stinking platform in the middle of the North Sea, which was hell <laughs> and nearly killed some people in a submarine. That's another story who got tangled in my cables because they weren't following the maps. But in any event, it worked. We uh, took the data back to Houston, Texas. I don't know which was worse, three months on a platform that people normally spend 10 days on uh, or a summer in Houston, uh, but it was, uh, it was interesting. So uh, that was a job. And then uh, still waiting on NSF, uh, I was offered a job at Exxon, Exxon Production Research. And uh, at that point, to be blunt, I really think I had enough of the summer heat in Houston. And I phoned up a buddy uh, from Brown who 
I mentioned before, Jens Peterson. He was working in Brea, California at uh, Unical, working on geothermal projects using MT. I said, hey, Jens, you got anything going? He said, yeah, sure, come out. He hired me. So I then uh, was working in geothermal using MT and developing algorithms and code at Coso Hot Springs and in the Philippines. Uh, and I got to play with my first color terminal on their IBM mainframe clone in Amdahl. So that was, that was formative. I then did a postdoc uh, down in San Diego again at, at uh, IGPP, uh, Cecil Light of Green Scholar. And really what I was working on was two things. Uh, I, I, I call them obscure algorithms for analysis and inversion of global EM data. Um, and also fiddling around with controlled source EM equipment and, and electrodes particularly. And I remember I was, I was in the uh, office uh, about six months into the, being there, I got an office mate. Uh, you, you may know Jason Phipps Morgan, some of you. So he was my office mate. And he was out that day, but this guy walks in and then it's, it's Cecil Green himself. I mean, he was quite old by then. But the great Cecil Green walked into my office and then he, he asked me what I was working on. And I told him, and I'll never forget what he said. Well, as long as you think that's interesting. <laughs> and he walked out. So anyway, I didn't care. I got paid. Um, and it was a great place. Scripps then was a really great place. You know, we had people like Sparweb, Steve Constable, Pascal Tariz, all were in that place at that time. And uh, I was developing some interesting, I think, uh, still interesting, silver server chloride electrodes from Marine EM. And I got uh, many of you, uh, especially older crowd, will know the, the enormous for the time M Slab experiment, which was in the uh, off the Pacific Northwest of, of the US and Vancouver. Uh, island as well, and uh, onshore, offshore. Uh, I was involved in the deployment of the MT array offshore, led by uh, Jean Fiu at Scripps, Lori Law at Pacific Geoscience Center in Canada. Uh, at the time, technically, I was a postdoc with Alan Chave, but actually, Alan had just left Scripps when I arrived and went to Bell Labs, so kind of winged it. But you know, Fiu's equipment was really interesting. So the state of the art marine then you had to separate the electric and magnetic field instruments. They were two separate instruments. The magnetic field, this also power was an issue, right? You didn't have lithium ion batteries and power was an issue. So fuse magnetometers were enormously long, large diameter cylinders containing a suspended torsion fiber magnet with a mirror on it. It was almost like something Gauss would have done with a collimated light beam that would bounce off the mirror and it would drive a feedback circuit that would, would center the magnet on a slit. So it was a nulling instrument. And he had three components of that and got the magnetic field that way. It was a brilliant design, kind of an electromechanical design. It wasn't the most sensitive thing in the world, as you can imagine, but it worked. For the electric field, again, another enormous instrument, giant flooded orthogonal tubes leading to a mechanical device that was a chopper that would switch uh, the polarity of the electrodes that the amplifiers saw. So doing that mechanically, you could null out any drift in the electrodes, any kind of low frequency or DC offsets in the electrodes. And you would just do like one stroke every few seconds. So that was, that was brilliant stuff, but you can imagine the complexity of analyzing data like that. Um, and I thought about it, I thought, well, God, we can make this smaller, lighter and cheaper now. Electronics has come along. We don't need to use choppers. We can use these newfangled 16-bit digitizers. Uh, we can uh, use induction coils and yada, 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 and, and package it. I wrote a proposal to NSF, didn't, didn't get funded. And with searing jealousy, uh, Steve Constable had also had similar notions, went the industry funding route and built a, an empire off of that kind of smaller, lighter, cheaper, compact design relative to previous designs. So kudos to Steve. Uh, Next uh, adventure in joining the MT club was an assistant professor back at the University of Washington. And I started getting into these embedded systems. And this, if you're not familiar with the term, an embedded system is where you have basically raw circuits and it's, uh, it's got some sort of processor, but there's no operating system or anything. It's got nothing. You basically have to flash the operating system and yourself and write it and build up a system from those basic uh, components. So this is an actual, Alan Jones will possibly remember this. It's in my lab now. I took this photo yesterday. This is the actual system we deployed 
at a wonderful place called Cardi Lake in Northern Ontario that uh, was a very formative experience. It was a lakeside installation of this, this large metal box. It's the size of a, you know, a, a, a travel trunk. You see this big iron mallet um, for scale. And it was a, uh, uh, it used the, the first time I used one of Barry Nayrod's wonderful uh, and John Bennis' wonderful uh, observatory quality magnetometers, which I continue to use to this day. Uh, these metal boxes inside the big box, box on the right, they're individually shielded uh, analog and digital sections of this device with careful coax cable. I mean, it's just meticulously done. There's a, um, to the left, left third of the interior of this uh, device, there's this kind of big shiny thing with four uh, slots. Each of those slots holds a one megabyte um, ultraviolet light erasable read-only, programmable read-only memory. That was our memory for this, this device. And then uh, the NARAD uh, and Bennis um, electronics on the far left. So this is what it took at that time to get a 16-bit relatively high speed, like one sample per second class um, uh, MT system going. And then uh, again, big uh, array of silver silver chloride electrodes in the lake bottom and magnetometer buried below ground on shore. So that, that worked really well. We published a, a paper um, in 93 here in GRL where we could see fine scale structures in the transitions in the electrical conductivity in the uh, upper and mid mantle transition zone, got to do things like uh, develop genetic algorithms to test model space. And it was, it was a really wonderful project. Um, and again, very formative in advancing the next uh, level of digital, digital MT. And then I moved off to Cambridge University for nine years, three years to Cardiff. And then since uh, 2003, I've been at Oregon State University in my present uh, position. My, my years in the UK were mainly not involving MT. They were still doing global scale Connectivity and algorithm development and, and better, better 3D inversions for global scale problems. Uh, but in terms of the experimental thing, aside from one or two exceptions, uh, I was really working in seafloor hydrothermal research for, for those years. So I took a little bit of a holiday from MT with a couple of exceptions. One was in 1993, I carried out an MT experiment with Kathy Whaler in Zimbabwe using uh, equipment in the UK NERC a geophysical equipment pool up in Edinburgh and we're in Zimbabwe getting this stuff going. And I remember this circuit board fell out of uh, uh, in, uh, not, not a well secured case after shipping. And there was Alan Jones's signature. It was a hand soldered circuit board made by Alan Jones, which was hilarious. Um, stuff was, you know, old stuff and it, it kind of worked. Uh, problem is uh, we left it in the care of uh, University of Harare and when it eventually got back to Cambridge, there was like nothing working anymore. So it was nearly a total write-off, but a great life experience. I also started up a little company called Earth Ocean Systems and we developed instrumentation for extreme environments. And then when I got to Oregon State, um, somebody asked me at, at IRIS actually, who was running the EarthScope uh, seismic uh, and technically uh, had oversight of the MT program, if I might be interested in getting involved in that. And after some hesitation, I agreed. And eventually, uh, more or less became the lead of the EarthScope MT program and its successors, and also founded our current instrument pool, uh, the National Geoelectromagnetic Facility. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. So what's the take home message of this? You know, being an aging baby boomer, you know, and there are a number of us on this call, you know, we got to use computers when they were basically hand-built, you coded on paper or on cards or switch panels. You had to, as an MT person, design the experiment, design and build the instruments, deploy and retrieve them under really terrible conditions, wade through really bad signal to noise ratios, create new algorithms to analyze the data when the statistics underlying the noise distribution were not really understood. This was before the dawn of robust methods. So in other words, you as a practitioner to get up to speed and to become an expert had to own the entire creative cycle and to be totally and solely responsible for the outcomes. That is if you manage to get funded. So that's why I'm giving you this long intro. That circumstance really 
Sounds terrible, right? It's a, it's a horrible barrier to doing MT. It's also a rare privilege because very few people get that experience today. You know, what we do in my labs, we try to maintain that spirit so everyone becomes exposed to all aspects to the greatest extent we can arrange. But only a very few labs are really left in the world that offer that kind of immersion or what I'll, what I'll call uh, Edisonian invention and discovery. And, you know, I can think of like on the West Coast of the US, uh, Constable's lab is, is sort of in that spirit as well. There were a small number in the States, uh, vanishingly few, unfortunately, and, and vanishingly few in, in the Western world. I think there are a number of them certainly that have emerged in places like uh, China, but uh, it's, it's a, dying, a dying thing, unfortunately. So given that, where do we go from here? So how do we lower the price of admission? How do we lower the price of operation of MT, the, the, the price of understanding the data and interpreting it? Now, what has happened in these intervening decades is our equipment has become more sophisticated. You can go to a relatively small number of commercial MT equipment suppliers. You can get some very capable, very nice instruments. The commonality between them is they all are a lot of money. They're very expensive instruments. You can easily spend $60,000, $70,000 US on a, a high-end wideband instrument. So there are improvements, but that's a barrier. And if you really think about how our workflow works, our workflow really is mid 20th century. It hasn't substantially changed. We're just using better environments on better computers, but the actual act of how we obtain process and interpret the data really is substantially the same. And we have a culture now which assumes data comes from the internet. <laughs> it's the thing you get off the internet. And I used to really resist that, but now I'm thinking, well, all right, let's go with that. Data comes off the internet. Maybe it should. So how do we widen the take up of MT and related methods? We make the data come off the internet <laughs> and a few other things. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about what problems we address, what the bottlenecks are, and what I think one solution may help solve. So my uh, background in this is tempered by being responsible for some very large array MT surveys on regional and continental scales, uh, work involving 3D and 4D target discrimination, and things like reservoir monitoring and geothermal. Uh, so very briefly, um, this is a, a current snapshot of, I'd say the biggest, longest running project, which we used to refer to as the EarthScope or MScope uh, transportable array. But now that we've gone through NSF funding to the end of EarthScope, we got some bridging funding from NASA for a couple of years. And now Oregon State University is walk, working through uh, uh, an agreement with the US Geological Survey to continue the work. We just call it generically MT array. So we started this uh, in my lab in 2005, where I was responsible initially for installing seven quasi-permanent stations and underground vaults, empty long period stations, with the goal of exceeding 100,000 second period and kind of anchoring deep structure uh, stations across the conterminous United States, that is the US except for Alaska and Hawaii. And that got underway and then 2006, we had a, uh, a small core group that was overseeing the first deployments of transportable MT arrays on a station spacing grid of 70 kilometers our instruments for both cases were um, the, the Barry Nayrod and John Bennis uh, NIMS instruments, which sadly are no longer in production, but uh, we, we now possess the majority of the ones ever produced in support of this uh, project. So our plan now under the current and, and pending uh, final cooperative agreement with US Geological Survey, the current source of funding is to complete uh, these dots on the map uh, by roughly mid 2024, we'll have more than 1900 stations. These stations are installed in, in temporary rolling sub arrays. Uh, an individual station may be installed for many weeks to a couple of months typically to collect data that meets certain uh, very well-defined quality control standards and using very um, consistent uh, processing and metadata and operating principles uh, and, and again, we're using the NARAD NIM systems, uh, which we have heavily modified and modernized because they've not been in production for a very long time. And we've added a lot of features to them and hardware and software. We uh, use our own electrodes and we built a large instrument pool by 
possessing, owning, and borrowing from others as well. And I'll talk about that. Now, the motivation for this kind of continental scale work is fundamental geosciences initially, certainly under NSF support. And I like this compendium from uh, Murphy and Egbert, uh, analyzing our data um, regionally, uh, not showing the conductivity structure at any depth, but this is actually the inter vertically integrated conductance, basically from mid cross down to 150 kilometers using the uh, Mod EM inversion of, you know, uh, Egbert and, and Mechbal and, and Kelbert. Um, and you just see the strong heterogeneity, three to four orders of magnitude, lateral heterogeneity in conductivity. And you see this basically at all depths through the section and it makes geological sense. So this is this was great, but we had a problem where scope ended as a program in 2018 and the MT program was only two thirds done with mapping this piece of the United States, the 48 conterminous US states, we hadn't completed the southern tier of states. We uh, had a problem. And what it transpired, however, is uh, a new application for the work. And many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, it turns out if you care about the intensity of geomagnetically induced currents that flow through critical infrastructure, and in this particular context, I'm talking about the electric power grid transmission system, and also pipelines, all critical to civilization, um, the intensity of those fields is determined not only by the instantaneous vector uh, magnetic field at every location along the path of the transmission network, but also the inductive response in the earth. It depends on the impedance, the empty impedance below you, and it involves a section of crust and upper mantle down to about 300, 350 kilometers. Uh, and it turns out once we started mapping the US systemically in 3D or systematically in 3D, it turns out this is the dominant thing. The 3D variations in the conductivity structure dominate the intensity of the GICs, not even the intensity of the magnetic field is, is the, the dominant factor. This was not current thinking in the electric utilities or in the regulating, uh, regulatory sphere and you can see the, the interdependencies once the power grid goes down and in extreme events, I mean, this is constantly stressing the, uh, in the US 2200 high voltage transformers that underpin the, the long haul transmission network um, in the coterminous US. Uh, so that's bad, but also in more extreme events, big solar kernel mass ejections pointed at earth uh, that lead to larger geomagnetic disturbances, generally planetary indices of Kp greater than seven, say, uh, G2 to G3 geomagnetic storm classes. Um, if things are aligned just the wrong way, you can actually cause these transformers to become unstable and even fail. And you can get cascading failures that can bring down large sections of the power grid. And the consequences are really awful. You lose basically all the critical aspects of modern technological uh, civilization. It was estimated by the Department of Homeland Security a number of years ago that were a, uh, an 1850s style Carrington event, if you're familiar with that, really big uh, space weather event, were to hit the earth today, uh, you would lose a large section of the US power grid uh, for months and months and potentially years because these transformers are all individually bespoke designed for that particular circuit. And they have a lead time to replace them if you don't have any spares. And at that point, there were hardly any spares. They had a lead time of two to three years. Uh, the estimated fatality rate in the United States from the basic, basically the interruption of the power grid for, for a year, this is Department of Homeland Security uh, numbers, 90% of the population would die within a year because we would suddenly become a pre-industrial civilization. You'd have no water, you'd have no fuel, you'd have nothing. So it's a big deal, it got a lot of attention. We had a near miss in 2012 with an enormous Carrington event size coronal mass ejection, missed Earth by one week in its orbit. And it had, had it hit, we'd be living in this scenario. So it got a lot of attention. Now, one of the things we do with these data, we get our empty survey points. This was done before we, entered the Southern US, so I black, black that out here, stippled it out. 
Uh, you're looking at a map of the power transmission network. Those are the blue lines. We then have developed algorithms using uh, real-time or archived geomagnetic observatory data that flows in uh, to uh, various algorithms we developed that allow us to estimate the uh, voltages related to the geomagnetically induced currents in the transformers in the substations in the transmission network. In order to do this accurately, we need to have some very sensitive information from the thousands of power utilities in the US that, just, that transmit power. But uh, this is a simplification. And what we did was we took the magnetic field uh, recorded during uh, uh, 13 March, 1989, which is when a big event happened, space weather event happened, and it caused the failure of the power grid in Quebec. Hydro-Quebec went down and there were consequences all across North America. And so what you're looking at is a time step movie of the anomalous part of the voltages seen at all these substations referenced to a mythical grounding location in, I think it was Ohio. And we've simplified the configuration of the power grid just to get an idea of the scale of these. And a really big circle is a thousand volts. Okay, so this is kind of part of a number of projects we're working on to uh, help provide information to the utilities to mitigate risk. But the um, problem is we had no money. <laughs> Earthscope was over. NASA could bridge us for a couple of years, but this got attention at a very high level. And um, working with a lot of collaborators on many aspects of this, such as Jeff Love and Anna Kelbert at USGS and Antti Bukinen and, and Jim Spann at NASA and Andy Frazetto at IRIS, we managed to cobble together enough bridging support while we were working on a longer term solution. This got up to White House level. Uh, there's a committee in the Office of Science and Technology Policy that directly advises the president called the Swarm Committee. And this became a very big agenda item and it ended up generating a presidential executive order requiring us to complete the MT array in the conterminous US in order to mitigate risk to critical infrastructure. First time in history, the word magneto to lyrics that has appeared in an executive order and as a line item in a federal budget in the US. Uh, so this is a photo of the guy in the middle is me. Uh, the person uh, in the photo on my left is actually a major general who's dressing as a civilian that day. Uh, my guest on the other side is uh, our, our university's vice president for research. And we're kind of cooling down after I made a presentation uh, in the Situation Room to some interesting people about this. Uh, and I'm actually sitting at, at then Vice President Pence's desk uh, in his office. He, that was lo lo basically loaned to us. And then we had to run off to the Senate to try to get some money. It was a very interesting uh, day. And uh, there are a lot of regulatory issues that uh, emerged from this process, basically requiring certain data sharing and also the completion of the MTRA. So uh, we're working under those conditions and it's, it's kind of in order and we're doing it. Okay, now when you're doing something like this, you need a facility to support it. So this is the, uh, the National Geoelectromagnetic Facility at Oregon State University. Uh, by the middle of 2019, we'd assembled, uh, uh, I think it was, nine, I say here, 98 land MT systems, 60 were long periods, long periods. Uh, aside from a couple were all uh, the, the NIMS, uh, Barry and John's uh, NIMS systems, uh, 28 wideband systems, uh, I'll talk about briefly, and 10 very specialized radio frequency MT systems. And the ownership of the long periods is kind of complex. They're owned by us, they're also owned by NSF and also loaned by University of Man Manitoba. So we put them all together to get enough equipment to do continental scale work. Uh, and we've been heavily modifying the instrument since uh, implementing real-time cloud synchronized telemetry, among other things. And also in the latter part of the talk, talk about these new, really uh, much cheaper uh, capable systems that we're building the first 24 of right now. Uh, we also do our own electric field sensors. We build electrodes on a very massive scale um, in a dedicated electronics lab. They're dual chamber uh, gel electrodes. The, the current version is a lead lead chloride chemistry. We have a, uh, a test and calibration facility that allows us to have controlled temperatures, controlled temperature gradients, programmable temperature uh, variations, uh, et cetera. And then to uh, use a precision um, uh, hundreds of channel multimeter to 
measure things like contact resistances and uh, AC and DC voltages. And it helps us pair the electrodes and understand their thermal drift. We're continually improving this system. And we also have a, uh, I'll call it a fairly rudimentary still because it's manual, it hasn't been automated yet, uh, magnetic field calibration system inside of Faraday shield. Um, and so you're seeing on the left here, the, the foundation of the large scale long period MT array, the, the, the NIMS magnetometer is the uh, horizontal uh, flat, you know, PVC tube on the left. Um, and then what we call the receiver, which is the data acquisition system in the Pelican case in the center and some of our older style, what we call series two electrodes. Uh, this can be configured for transportable array work or permanent uh, observatory work. And we're seeing one of our backbone stations here in the right where we've installed the the flux heat magnetometer two meters down in an insulated underground vault, and then separated another vault, which has all of the electronics, the receiver, uh, solar power, and rudimentary real-time telemetry for quality of service. And we ran those for a number of years. Uh, we also have these uh, wideband instruments. Now these were co-developed. I got uh, funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, if you remember, there was a big global recession in uh, 2008, you know, the stock market crashed globally. Uh, President Obama had a stimulus program. It was called the American Recovery and Something Act, ARA. And we managed to get some money for that and uh, built uh, with a, a company, some of you know, Zong uh, in Tucson, Arizona. We jointly developed this new wideband instrument. So this was like 11, 12 years ago now. And uh, it was capable of sample rates up to uh, 4,096 per second per channel. It was the first portable geophysical instrument that had 32-bit digitizers. We went from 24 to 32-bit. Um, we, we built 16 of those, and then we have 10 custom ones that are 24-bit but can sample uh, at 1.8 million samples per second for radio frequency MT. And we have a lot of induction coils, so I've got a whole bunch of different types of induction coils. I can't count, but it must be close to 50 of those. And also we can equip some of these systems with flux gates as well. And we have 10 uh, custom LEMI 031s. So uh, think about these digitizers, which are really kind of transformational. 32 bits a big deal because we're living in an increasingly uh, noisy, urbanized world. And so EM noise levels, undesirable uh, exogenic noise levels are increasing. And so if you wanna do practical work in, in this wildly overpopulated world, you wanna pull signal out of a noisier and noisier environment. Uh, so you may have a 32-bit digitizer going along at you know, 1,024 samples a second, but a lot of those bits are, are noise. They're not noise-free 32 bits. But as you go to lower and lower frequencies, you get more and more noise-free bits. By the time you get to one hertz sample rates, you have 27 noise-free bits. So you're ahead of a game. Uh, a conventional analog digital converter that might be 24 bits. You're lucky to get 24 noise-free bits at that frequency, much less 27. And for lower frequencies, you get even more bits and eventually you get 32 noise-free bits. So that's just a comment about how the technology is developed and how I really only now use 32-bit digitizers unless there's a good reason not to. Uh, and these are also network. They used a mesh network called Zigbee. Um, so that's where we were. And we experimented with configuring the same kind of hardware for marine use. So we're actually, what you're looking at is a very uh, prototype device we've used actually for a shallow water offshore measurements of electric and magnetic fields not for MT or CSEM, but to detect the signature, uh, the noise signature of offshore wave power plants, which is a big thing here. We have a big test facility. There are environmental compliance requirements to measure these things. And this is something we can drop off the side of a, a medium-sized vessel and take, uh, take measurements. This is a, a system, again, based on the 32-bit digitizers. Uh, it does three components of electric, three components of magnetic using short um, ANT2 coils manufactured by Zong slash Geotel. Uh, work well. And then we started to package it in a more fancy way, this device on the right with a much younger version of 
Uh, my lab manager, Brady Fry, who's probably cringing right now because it shows him as a, as a young, young little guy. And now he's up, all grown up. <laughs> um, sitting in front of this thing we designed, it's actually turned on its side and being held in a frame. It's a trawl resistant, uh, self-buoyant shell that holds fundamentally what you're seeing on the left, but in a free fall package that lands on the, on the seafloor, it has a concrete drop weight that looks like the heat shield of an Apollo capsule. It was designed using computational fluid dynamics to minimize uh, vibrations uh, from seawater flowing past it. And it's a nine channel device that has three electric, three magnetic and three seismic channels. And it does timekeeping with a chip scale atomic clock. So it was kind of like my fantasy device. And we, we started playing around to see if we could make an all in one. Oh, and it did acoustic telemetry. So then we started saying, all right, let's take all this, everything we've learned. And you know, we've gone from a process of making things cheaper to in that last device, making them really expensive. Let's go back to cheap. For land use, how can we take everything we've learned and start consolidating it into a way that's going to reduce the cost of getting your gear and operating it? Now, I should mention, of course, different countries have ways of making gear appear, uh, available to academic scientists. Like in the US, I was running a national equipment pool, I still am, um, that was working on a financial model, unfortunately, that was imposed by NSF that cost people money to use the equipment, to rent it. Uh, fortunately, uh, IRIS was able to get supported to uh, add MT to the Pascal Instrument Center where no money need change hands. And so I was involved in helping IRIS um, you know, evaluate equipment and they've uh, purchased a bunch of uh, Phoenix gear and Zong coils and Lemmy systems and they're gonna provision people with this. But of course there are limitations to that you can only have the equipment for so long and it's still, in terms of workflow, pretty conventional. It's, it's great, but really it's hard for a non-expert to get up to speed on this. So here we have uh, on the right, a bunch of what we now call our series four electrodes, an early version of them. We build in huge numbers for the electric field dipoles. And on the left, a packaging concept. And this packaging concept, it's a battery box. The two black objects are individual uh, lithium polymer batteries, rechargeable lithium polymer batteries, which is what we favored at the time because the concept was we could actually insert a flux gate sensor, mag magnetometer, into the same box as long as we kept the, the ferrous materials away, as well as the receiver, the data acquisition system, and the telemetry system have a positional sensor and simply go to take the box, drop it on the ground, and it runs with Wi Fi control. And that worked up to a point, but we, we really encountered a lot of downsides. Actually, one of the downsides is it's too visible, it's easy to steal, very tempting, and animals can kick it. <laughs> and that's a real problem. Um, so we started thinking about uh, more secure ways of deploying it. And uh, other, other things we've tried, this is a, uh, one of these uh, Zen wideband systems, Zong OSU Zen wideband systems deployed for geothermal reservoir monitoring at Newbury Volcano in Central Oregon. We've had a, a long association with that project there. Uh, this was during a geothermal stimulation project. And uh, my, one of my techs at the time, Valerie Claude, is configuring uh, the Zen uh, for a, a wideband run and powered by solar, but in the winter also powered by methanol fuel cells, which is what that box with the two giant black snorkels is to vent, uh, to get air into it and to vent uh, CO2 from the fuel cells. So we did that. Uh, it was quite successful in, in a manner of speaking. It wasn't a big geothermal stimulation, but the, the systems worked. Um, other, uh, other projects, and Max will appreciate this in 2018, we went back to Mount St. Helens. A uh, guy on the extreme right is Graham Hill, who had done some very important work there during the um, first eruption after the big, the big 1980 eruption, and it was a dome building eruption. And he uh, has subsequently done work in New Zealand that shows changes in some of the key MT responses during uh, changes in the uh, volcanic recharge cycle. And that led us to ask that question for Mount St. Helens. Could we do that? Could we reoccupy stations that he had occupied decade and a half before 
leave them installed and do monitoring and see if we can see any precursors to renewed uh, injection of magma. Uh, the guy in the middle of that left photo is Jan Avram from Phoenix, Vice President of Phoenix Geophysics. And what we did is we brought equipment from OSU, the wideband Zongzen systems. Um, Phoenix brought their latest and greatest MTU-5s and latest coils. And we did some test deployments and compared results. On the right, Graham is using uh, uh, a, a concept that I worked on. Uh, I talked to the guy who actually builds his on coils, uh, John Sarlos, and talked about how they responded when they're in air and worked out that if we clamp the three coils tightly together at their center of mass in this orthogonal configuration, put them on the ground and establish what the orientation of the sensors was, uh, or if, and I should say, if it's windy, we put a non-magnetic tent over them so they don't get buffeted by the wind. Um, you can actually mathematically rotate them into principal coordinates and you have a sub-aerial deployment of the induction coils. And if you do the same with the electrodes, put them in a big porous bag full of salty wet bentonite lightly brush the ground, wet it, put the electrodes in the bag, put a plastic container and a tarpaulin on it. All of a sudden you have an empty insulation that involves no ground disturbance. Why do we care? We are gonna do a big experiment in Yellowstone, super volcano, wide band experiment. We were having real difficulties getting permits from the National Park Service. We couldn't go anywhere interesting in the backcountry because we were going to disturb the ground to install our stuff. And on a very difficult phone call after working with my, my co-PI, Ninfa Bennington, uh, it was kind of a joint production of Ninfa and, and me and our, our crews, uh, I, I blurted out, well, what if we can demonstrate we can do MT without ground disturbance? They said, all right, show me. <laughs> so we went to Newberry Volcano to one of our permitted sites and tried this out, subaerial MT, and it actually worked. And it was faster and cheaper and lighter to deploy. You could do this really quickly. So we then got a waiver. Uh, well, actually, we got permitted by, by Yellowstone, collected a great data set we're still chewing on. I got a waiver from requirement of permitting from the National Forest Service. I could send my uh, postdoc, Esteban Bols Martinez, back into the Newberry National Volcanic Monument, Caldera, which had been closed to any geophysical exploration for 30 years. And he was doing MT there. So this, again, faster, lighter, cheaper, be a little bit creative. You can reconfigure what you've got. Now, let's talk about other ways of keeping things efficient, and reducing the cost of getting your data and getting it interpreted. First thing is we're doing ever larger, more complex projects, hundreds or thousands of deployments in a project. Logistics is everything. How do we handle logistics efficiently? How do we handle a rolling temporary array that might span thousands of kilometers and have many field crews operating simultaneously and coordinating with each other? What are the things that cause delays, bottlenecks, drive up costs, lead to missed targets? How do you establish strong technical support back at the instrument depot so you can execute fast repairs? You can have tight communications with your field crews with your permitting people, with overall management. It's all about situational awareness. So well, I'll end the talk talking about hardware, data flow, and software. Now I'm gonna talk about situational awareness. And basically, how do we make it more efficient and lower costs? So barriers to wide-scale adoption of MT. All right, snapshot from yesterday. My lab currently has four big field trucks. Uh, we just bought two more. We're going to cycle some of the old ones out. We use real-time fleet tracking systems. Uh, so I know where the crews are. I know what they're doing. I know how well they're driving. I know if their trucks have any problems. I can let them know they have a mechanical problem before they know it. And we can redirect them to get, get things fixed. Um, we can determine if a particular crew member habitually drives aggressively because we found that maps to problems other problems in the field that can lead to issues that hurt production time. Uh, but in addition to knowing what the vehicles are doing and what the crews are doing, we uh, have a system for producing semi-automated daily site visit 
reports and also production, what we call production reports. So they tell us what they did at that particular site and they also tell us what they did that day because they could have been at multiple sites. And this is very formalized. We use established forms, established types of metadata. Uh, there's a systematic way of issuing instrument problem reports. We make heavy use of Slack, Slack workspaces with dedicated channels. We uh, have a system right now before we implement real-time telemetry in all of our sites, which we're just, we're just starting to do in the coming months, um, of crew visits. They'll visit a site after so many days or weeks. They'll get the data. We have a way of them doing very, uh, very efficient processing of the data in the field, single station processing. And then as soon as that field computer sees a Wi-Fi signal, it automatically synchronizes to multiple cloud services. And we have the results here. So um, that is then sent to somebody who's responsible for final processing, we make the decision whether or not the uh, system meets our, our, our standards, our, our, our data standards, and then it goes off to archive. And for the current arrangement, that's handled uh, by Jade Crosby at USGS in Denver, that, that archival and uh, final processing loop. So we do a lot, of, a lot of coordination between a lot of players. And you know, green geophysics is, is, has been our longest running uh, Fieldwork uh, sub subcontractor uh, run by Lou Pellerin, and that, they're doing a fantastic job working with us on a daily basis, uh, collecting the data, doing the siting and permitting with me, uh, the siting with me and Lou, and the permitting with Lou. And uh, we have weekly web meetings uh, for permitting, data quality planning, and weekly reporting uh, requirements. So very tight knowledge, situational awareness. Uh, Green Geophysics maintains for us a continuously updated map of uh, status of the individual stations that are either running, just completed, permitted, about to be installed, et cetera. And it's all color coded and it's kept up to date all the time. So we know what the plans are. Um, safety is everything. If you want to lower costs, you can't have incidents. We've been doing this for over 15 years. I don't wanna, I don't wanna say anything that's gonna to lead to trouble. We have not yet had a major incident. Uh, nobody's had a, a significant injury. Um, and we've had many scores of field crew members and our field crews tend to be drawn from people who are very engaged in and interested in science. They may be considering a graduate degree in geophysics. We hope they get interested in magnetotellurics. Many of them have been through the Summer of Applied Geophysical Experiences program, SAGE, um, and they get a job uh, for weeks, months, or even in some cases, multiple years. Uh, and they become proficient, become crew chiefs, and they help us educate the next generation. Um, and they do it safely and efficiently. So we need to give our crews uh, awareness of field conditions if we're gonna do this efficiently. For example, uh, I have a web portal I could open up at some point if there's time or questions that basically links to everything relevant. And one of the things that it links to is national and regional fire and smoke maps. We are certainly seeing the effects of climate change on an appalling scale, impacting our field operations continuously. Right now it's, it's massive flooding in, in Alabama and Florida. In uh, summers, we were seeing temperatures of 50 centigrade in the desert Southwest. I mean, it's just mad stuff. Uh, smoke and fires have to be avoided. We have to have crews trained in industrial fire precaution level procedures with equipment to combat uh, local fires, fires so they're allowed to get into certain land under fire conditions. Uh, I reference every day uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center at, at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to see the predicted uh, geomagnetic activity levels because uh, that information can inform the crews that maybe in two days, we're likely to see a, a really favorable signal level for long period MT. And so they should prioritize getting more instruments in the ground rather than say getting a few permits from a motel room, right? So that makes things more efficient. Um, then we have our very um, structured reporting every day. Every field crew reports back assisted by software uh, or user interface for instruments uh, written by uh, Brady Fry here, it's Python code base, 
that helps populate a lot of this and semi-automates this. And so we get daily production reports, what they did that day in a particular format, site visit reports, makes it easy to localize things in time and space. Uh, and again, they're all synced uh, on various cloud services. Uh, they also email reports to us every night and they use Slack workspace channels to report things. Uh, typically for long period MT, each field crew is a two person crew. So it's a light crew, it keeps costs down. They have a three quarter ton four by four pickup truck with a fancy lockable canopy. Generally we equip them with 11 NIMS instruments per truck and lots of support equipment. And they report back every evening. And I'm just showing some output uh, from uh, reports showing things like measurements of contact resistances, uh, AC and DC voltages between dipole lines, uh, gain settings, battery voltages, and then some field process data on the right showing uh, parent resistivities and phases and tippers and time series that we get every day from the crews every time they extract data. Um, but you can do better. So I'll, tell, I'll talk about kind of what we're doing now and into the future. I'll segue into that for the rest of the talk. It's good to have telemetry. We like to have real-time telemetry. So the crews aren't blind because they don't know if the systems are really operating properly without telemetry. And I can guarantee at any given moment, something's wrong with something somewhere. So Paul Bedrosian at US Geological Survey with his then engineer implemented a nice little board which we call the State of Health Board that can work with the NIMS systems. And he loaned us six of these and they use uh, low data rate satellite telemetry to give us some kind of statistical information basically about what's going on in the systems that we can use to uh, kind of be alerted to major problems like something's wrong with the magnetometer, something's wrong with the electric dipoles, for example. So that we have that, uh, but really it's great. And I, I like it, I wanna use it, but there's kind of something you can do beyond that. And that's the gold standard. And that is full real-time telemetry of all your data in a robust and secure manner. And that way you can process the data remotely in the cloud and have full knowledge of, of the, the situation on the ground. And in fact, you might find by supporting real-time telemetry that you've achieved a, a required data quality standard ahead of time. Well, that information is incredibly valuable because you can then use it to uh, change the plan for you know, what the nearest fuel crew might be doing in the coming days in order to extract that system, get it out of the ground and move to the next location. So uh, this is something we're implementing and we're building this now, this automatic cloud synchronization through remote temp telemetry, uh, full data sets and uh, soon remote command and control into all future hardware. Uh, this is just a picture of that first element of improved situational awareness, which is the state of health monitor. And so you're not actually looking at time series, you're looking at basically analyses, uh, almost like probability density functions of what's going on in the electric field channels and some status of the magnetic field. Uh, there's a magnetic field uh, in, uh, flux gate status by it, and then things like battery voltage and such like. And this tells us that there may be a problem on one of the systems equipped with SOH and we can send a field crew out to look at it early. Uh, now, what other, so that's, that's a barrier. What's the other barrier? Commercial systems are expensive, right? They really are expensive. There are a lot of good ones out there. I just have some, some images of a whole bunch, some of which we've, we own, some of which we played with, some of which we helped develop. So that's a barrier. If you're doing this commercially, you pay a lot of money. If you can use a, an instrument pool that provides it free for academic use, there are only so many instruments, you can only have it for so long. If you're doing long observations or monitoring work, you can't really use a pool for that generally because somebody else needs it. Uh, commercial licenses for empty data processing can be quite expensive. Uh, there are open source solutions being developed and you know, Carl Kepler has, has a project underway through IRIS to um, basically you know, re redevelop uh, our current workflow in uh, fundamentally a Python code base. It's all good stuff. Other people have, have similar things they're working on. Uh, commercially though, it's expensive. And if you use these open source ones, you have to have some knowledge of coding really to be a proficient in it. And there are of course, very few 3D inversion codes generally available 
you know, Maudie M written by, uh, written here by Gary Egbert and Nasser Beckbell and Anna Kelbert and friends are, you know, it's, it's available. People use it widely and there are a couple of others out there. Uh, it's, it's relatively expensive for commercial use. It's not free, of course. And it's a barrier for somebody who's not really proficient in encoding and operating uh, a system at that kind of level of support where you're supporting the software on a system. And also, uh, Nestor Meckbell has very cleverly turned this into a software as a service where you know, he can kind of run it, run it for a client, which is a, a good model. And we like the software as a service model. But so all of these elements are, are impediments to wide scale adoption and efficient and inexpensive use. And just the routine data processing can be really time consuming and often requires coding. So there we are. Let me go to the end here, which is we're going to talk about latest developments. We call it, you know, everyone knows about the Internet of Things, IoT. We call this IOMT, Internet of MT. This has a hardware aspect and it has kind of a data flow and software aspect. So on the left, here are our goals, low cost devices, low cost integrated MT systems that can work for long period initially and what we call extended band. Extended band might be uh, from near DC to maybe um, 100 Hertz. And then ultimately wideband, okay, all on the same platform. For the long period configuration, uh, like we tried earlier, we want to have a system that integrates the Fluxgate magnet, magnetic field sensors with the MT data acquisition receiver and telemetry system in a single package. And we also want the potential to integrate an external induction coil set as well. On the data and software end on the right, all of this is based on a cloud-based model and software stack. The way we move data is generally through the 4G uh, cellular data network, the mobile data network, which is ubiquitous in much of the world. In the North America, it's called LTE, right? Long-term evolution. And it's, it's nearly everywhere. I'll talk about that. And basically different customers or clients have different requirements. So we want to, provide this as a service, but as a nested layer, like an onion skin layer model, where depending on your level of familiarity or need, you would have maybe only core services or more elaborate services built on top. And for the data flow to be managed in a way that it's secure and there's a high reliability web interface and there are methods of validating the data and to archive and process it, that satisfy the needs of any individual client because it could be an academic user. It could be a, you know, a government lab, but it could be a commercial user too. And they may have very specific requirements that you can't meet. So we want a model based on basically a virtual machine or in, in the terminology of Amazon Web Services, an instance that can be replicated, but firewalled away from any other instance. And they could have completely different data flow paths. So, we started this, all right, I should mention, this is kind of an unfunded project. I mean, this was a, a side project that Brady Fry and I started on five years ago. We have pretty intense day jobs. So it's something we do at nights and weekends. It's just sort of like we're, we're kidding, you know, playing around as hobbyists initially. We started this in 2017 on this small side project. And the first, the first mission was to kind of do this, but see how cheap we could make it. And we came on a configuration we called the Puck. And until this year, it was called the puck because our form factor was something that looked a lot like an ice hockey puck in shape and size. And it was actually a dongle that clipped into an, a very inexpensive Android smartphone. And if you think about an Android smartphone, it's a, a semi-open operating system that uh, gives you massive data storage, all sorts of incredible uh, real-time telemetry capabilities, a fair amount of processing power, and a nice user interface. And these days you can buy it for $50 US if you don't need the latest and greatest. So we bought a bunch of these phones and we started designing the Puck. Uh, and you know, it was pretty viable, but along the way and experimenting with it, we, we kept encountering more and more limitations with Android that frustrated us. So at that point we said, okay, good concept. Let's use a dedicated platform instead, but learn from this. 
So we considered, and I've talked to a lot of people who want to be hobbyist MT uh, people and some who are quite advanced in this who are doing it. Uh, I can think of uh, particularly uh, a colleague, Martin Connors, University of Athabasca has got a, got a nice working system uh, based on one of these platforms. And um, you know what's out there for like the advanced hobbyist, Beagle boards, Raspberry Pi, everyone's heard of Arduino. It's very common in MicroPython. These are all the platforms we considered, but we're talking initially about a long period system that needs to be very low power. And the Beagle board and the Raspberry Pi both drew too much power. So we eliminated them. So that left Arduino and MicroPython as our, as our platform. And they're both very low cost. So that was good. Then we get down to our preferences, our preferences for software development environments. We've got a very large Python software stack here. And a lot of people in the community in MT are developing Python. Uh, less so for C and C++. Arduino pushes you into C and C++. So we went with MicroPython as our current platform. What's the baseline <clears throat> functionality of this system? Uh, its processor is an ARM processor. Uh, we want to certainly achieve one hertz sample rates. We want to transmit data on the 4G LTE mobile cellular data network that's everywhere. There are some issues, you can do this. You can achieve one hertz, you can even achieve 200 hertz per channel, 200 cycle samples per second per channel. But there are some servicing constraints on the analog to digital converter that lead to some overheads while the system is also trying to send data to a micro SD card and it's trying to talk to the telemetry and it's talking to its satellite nav timing system and real time clock. And you get jitter, unacceptable jitter in the sample timing. And jitter is not acceptable if you want a system that can also work for wideband and you have very fast sample rates because jitter, jitter leads to phase differences between the various electric and magnetic field channels that looks like a phase difference in the impedance. So you have to avoid that. Um, <clears throat> we didn't think we would initially have to implement this for the baseline system. And that is we uh, added a field programmable gate array in order to handle some of these time critical functions and offload them from the ARM processor. But we have even for the baseline system. And it's had enormous advantages. This helps service some of the timing critical aspects of taking those analog to digital conversions. It is an increase in complexity in the system design, but it also allows us to extend the sample rate enormously for wideband work. The uh, very simple conceptual design back in 2017 was we have our magnetic and electric field sensors. They feed into this device we were calling the PUC, this network enabled MT receiver system. And then off it goes through the uh, mobile uh, mobile network into some sort of cloud data aggregation system. So the first thing we started to do in addition to having this conceptual design was to look at what was out there for less expensive, highly capable flux gate sensors for the magnetic field. And uh, we have a whole bunch of custom versions of the Lemmy 417 from Ukraine uh, already in house. Uh, we got in a whole bunch of different models from Bartingdon in the UK. We looked at what uh, we could get, uh, we thought was the best system we could get from China, a company called Smoggle that's used for MT. Bought them in and started assessing them. Looking at lab and field testing, noise levels, performance, and also they all integrate differently and have different requirements into our system. How compatible are they with our requirements? And this actually continued on and off until last year. And then we ordered 24 of the units we selected for our initial build. Um, I'll talk about that. So again, this concept is again on the bottom right here, you have your network enabled MT receiver system. You're moving data in quasi real time through the mobile data network. It goes to what at that time was going to be an Android platform, and that would go to an OSU server, an actual physical server, which would deal with the user interface and send the data to cloud data storage and to uh, a human operator through a graphic user interface. Very simple concept. It's evolved a lot. Why use this method for telemetry? Well, as we're transitioning to 5G cellular telecoms globally, 4G um, isn't going away. It's, it's gonna be here for a long time. It's ubiquitous. The United States, uh, the Eastern two thirds of the United States, it's everywhere in the mountainous and desert parts of the West. You do have 
gaps, but it really is a very, uh, very much a ubiquitous system in much of the country. And what's happened is there are data plans now available for less than 15 US dollars per month per gigabyte. And if you're doing long-term, long period MT, that's plenty. Actually, currently I'm paying $13.50 US per month per, per system. So it's very low cost and it's more or less ubiquitous. And that's true elsewhere in North America, the system's compatible in Canada. Uh, and this is uh, current density of Canadian coverage. Um, prices aren't that different to the US. What's beautiful about uh, the system we're using is um, it's, a, it's a modular modem that can be replaced. So if you're operating, say in China, you would get a Chinese compatible one rather than a North American compatible one, uh, plug it in. Uh, but it also uses a smart SIM card that is able to automatically switch to the best available carrier network for that location. And the data plan runs on all of them. So it's agnostic as to the carrier. So you don't have to pre-configure things. You just have your ready to deploy systems, pop them in the ground and away you go. Europe as well, very well covered as we know. Uh, parts of Asia are well covered. Um, so it's just really becoming a, a global phenomenon for field work, it's accessible. Um, now where it doesn't happen, we can use state of health using low data rate, lower throughput satellite telemetry on Iridium. That's actually the, the system used. But what's emerging now is global high speed internet. There are a number of companies doing this, most famously Elon Musk's Starlink. So here's the map of the completed Starlink constellation and its footprint on Earth. Um, and it's nearly completed now. Um, so we're ground-based LTE mobile tele telephony data plans are not available, we can move to these uh, emerging systems like Starlink. Uh, now Starlink has some advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantages, rather than 15 or 13 US dollars a month, it's 100. And it's really right now meant for fixed base stations. But uh, if you're moving to a new location inside the territorial boundary, of the country in which you are licensed to use Starlink, that's a, that's a constraint. You can put in a change of address request. And as long as the footprint you're moving into isn't oversubscribed, you can move your MT equipment there and have Starlink. Uh, now, while it's $100 a month rather than 13, this gives you nearly 100 megabits per second up and down bandwidth. So you can do wideband MT all you like. Uh, you do have a, a base station you have to buy for about 500 US dollars. The real, the real disadvantage here is power. Our base case for our new system without telemetry is less than a watt. With telemetry, when it's actually actively telemetry, less than two watts, Starlink takes 100 watts. So all of a sudden you're talking about solar and storage batteries. But if you're doing semi-fixed operations, it's a wonderful option. Uh, ironically, when I was talking about space weather impacts on critical infrastructure, Elon needs to brush up on his space weather because last week there was a not very impressive coronal mass ejection, uh, a new set of Starlink satellites launched, and 40 of them were shoved out of orbit into the atmosphere by the blast of particles from the sun. Um, where are we now? Okay, the rest of this is current developments. It's a long talk. You're welcome to come in and out as you wish. Um, I'll tell you about what is now called the dart. We took the, we took the puck and we made it thinner diameter and longer. And uh, this is roughly 60 centimeters long for scale. This is the integrated system that we're currently uh, configuring and testing. This has all the electronics. It has connectors that you bring the electric field data into, has an antenna for the telemetry. It has an external, uh, power connector, and it has the flux gate integral to this, this package. So it's the first in what we <clears throat> view as a family of devices. It's low cost. It uh, does timing accurately and tightly using the GNSS, all of the global constellations for satellite nav. It supports Wi-Fi communication and control locally if there's a human operator with a Wi-Fi enabled device who wants to control it 
or also if you have a Starlink uh, device and it's serving as a Wi-Fi access point, that's how you can do the telemetry hop aside from the LTE that's built into this. And it's designed to be extremely fast to install. Again, efficient operation saves money. And basically what I'm not showing here is 60 centimeters. You need to take a uh, fairly powerful but battery powered drill with an auger bit and drill down about 60 centimeters, make a hole, put in this plastic liner. This thing's, we call it the sheath. This thing slots into the sheath and it can pivot vertically and then be clamped in place and it can rotate horizontally. So you can find magnetic north and you can make it vertical, clamp it in place, put a cap on it and it's deployed. And extracting it is similarly easier than current systems. If you look at a, a cross section through it, at the top, we have the, the DART data acquisition system. At the bottom, you've got the flux gate sensor. You've got shielding in between them. Again, our power budget is under a watt when telemetry is not firing under two watts. When telemetry is firing, it only fires a short amount of time, uh, every minute or so. We support five independent 32-bit analog to digital converters. Very often to save money and to save power, you use a single one and you multiplex all your channels into it. But if we want to do wideband MT work with fast sample rates, you get into all sorts of timing issues if you do that. It's hard to maintain the phase relationships between the various channels while you're letting the ADC uh, analog digital converter settle after you switch to a new channel, it's better to have independent ADCs. Uh, again, our, our basic thing is we fail if we can't maintain one sample per second across all channels. But in fact, even without implementing the floating point, I'm uh, sorry, the, uh, the uh, field programmable uh, gate array subsystem, we could demonstrate around 200 samples per second per channel and now much higher. The platform architecture and the digitizers we're using can support over 38,000 samples per second. So when we go to wideband, it'll be possible. Uh, again, we're using GNSS for timing and positioning, uh, Wi-Fi, it also has Bluetooth, uh, automatic hopping between the best available uh, mobile data network. And we're trying two different housings right now. One is made out of an aluminum alloy, uh, and we're in, uh, seeing the impact of that on the response of the magnetic fields to the flux gate. And we also have a, a plastic alternative if there's a problem with the aluminum one. Uh, so we've selected our sensors uh, after our initial testing. Uh, by November 2019, we we're getting very suspicious about some of the claims of sensor orthogonality uh, in the flux gates and some of the flux gates. Um, one of them, one of the ones we bought in cost over $3,000. I didn't really want to slice into it. Um, so fortunately across the street, a colleague has a, uh, a micro tomograph, x-ray micro tomograph machine. And we started looking inside one of them and we could actually quite clearly see issues with build quality and uh, the orthogonality claims were no way, no way possible. So that helped in the selection process. Um, <clears throat> now, Bardington really makes a lot of cool flux gates these days, and they're small and uh, not that expensive, uh, except they're, they're more and less expensive ones, more and less high power ones. For many years, the MAG-10 Bardington has been adopted by people doing MT, so it's a pretty safe choice. Uh, but we're looking for lower cost and lower power options, so we did a down select and we've settled on uh, the MAG 649 that we have the first 24 coming in on as the best candidate for the initial build to achieve high quality MT responses in the band of 10,000 seconds up to one to 10 seconds. And this, this provides a, a suitable noise spec. We want our sensors to have this noise spec or better, less than 10 picatesla RMS per hertz, root hertz at one hertz. Uh, this particular configuration has a bandwidth up to a kilohertz. And you might think I'm crazy. Why do I want a sensor with a bandwidth of a kilohertz if I'm doing long period MT? Well, that's for passive MT. We also do controlled source work. So we actually want to go past the, the low frequency dead band and into higher frequencies. And the sensor can see strong signals, artificial signals uh, above that band. And it had other acceptable properties. And uh, we could buy it stripped down, slightly less expensive, or inside its own IP67 rated watertight housing. And we actually went with that 
for a marginally higher cost as a fail safe, just in case our own uh, DART system external seals were to fail, if it was to flood, we wouldn't lose the flux gate. Uh, so we started doing some comparison tests. This is a field deployment of one of these devices at uh, my test site, which is very, it's basically, I have, a, I have a, a rural property with some acreage. It turns out to be a good long period test site for MT. And uh, we deployed there. And so we have a Bardenum Mag 649 plugged into a prototype we called the MicroPuck, which was a breadboarded hand wired uh, uh, initial version of what's becoming the Dart Electronics. And we ran it last November. And that's what you're seeing on the left hand side the XYZ, XYZ channels of the magnetic field um, in blue from that device. And the data we pulled off from the Newport, Washington Geophysical Observatory, which is at almost exactly the same magnetic declination as our test site, but about 700 kilometers to the Northeast. And you can see how well the three components of the magnetic field track each other, uh, the difference being the difference in geomagnetic latitude. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we're, we're again showing that, uh, but rather than our instrument, we're showing a different time series section for a NARAD uh, NIMS MT instrument and its flux gate. And again, you can see that our new device is doing a similarly good job to tracking the data at the Magnetic Observatory, factoring in the different geomagnetic latitudes as uh, the NARAD instrument. Here we're seeing, again, a comparison between the NARAD NIMS instrument. All three channels now are full MT installation at our test site for the same time period as this prototypical micro pack puck with a Bardeen in 649. Oh, we did have, this is a breadboarded system, an early prototype. We did, looking at the spectrum, find some issues with it. Some, some uh, special peaks were appearing that were noise pickup from other components in the system that are being you know, engineered out of it with you know, production boards. But even with that, we're seeing really excellent fidelity in comparison with uh, the NIMS. Okay, what are the major functional blocks of the, what we're calling the DART now? Uh, well, you have basically two, two aspects. On the right, you have the processor, the ARM processor. And its division of labor is to get the satellite nav signals from all the different constellations to set the timing pulse for the real-time clock, to write data to local storage and micro SD card, so that if there's a total system failure, you can't communicate with the device and the system is retrieved, you don't lose the data. And also it handles the communication uh, across the LTE mobile telephone network. And then all the other nasty stuff that's time critical is handled by the field programmable gate array system that actually interrogates the real time clock and sets the uh, precise times to take the analog digital converter samples precisely at the same time across all channels. The ADCs, we've got five of them, five digital converters, 32 bit resolution, maximum sample rate of up to 38.6 samples, kilosamples samples per second, 38,600 samples per second. We use a full, uh, I hope you can still see me. I just got a weird thing from Zoom. Uh, um, a GNSS receiver for our timekeeping and positioning. We use all of the major constellations, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Baidu. It's modular and upgradable, and it maintains a timing synchronization tight to 21 nanoseconds. So we can have wideband MT with good phase relationships between the different channels. Um, Wi-Fi is supported. So uh, if you're in the vicinity of the device and you wanna control it, you can use a laptop. Uh, we, we've been developing on that platform, actually on a Mac OS platform, that's our favorite one for development, but it's agnostic to operating systems. Um, we're in the process of implementing it on, on handheld devices, on, on tablets, and on uh, mobile phones as well uh, for both iOS and Android. So when you're at, at the place and you want to do something to the system, you can control it without wiring it up or removing it. Uh, you can also download data locally. And if you're in a place where you can't get uh, LTE signal and you have something like a Starlink Wi-Fi access point, you can use that. 
We have a control interface. Uh, this is an evolved uh, version of the control system we use for actually connecting to a NIMS and setting it up. Uh, Brady Fry coded this. Again, it's a Python code base. And if you want to start a run, again, you're entering metadata in a very uh, rigid way. You can't start a run without doing it. And you can file one of your site visit reports by hitting a button because it'll, it'll send the metadata and you can start a run. Uh, LTE communications, uh, it's a modular, uh, basically a daughter board uh, that's certified for North America. It can be swapped for a different one for other regions of the world. And again, as I said, it's agnostic as to the mobile telephone network and it auto switches between the best available carrier. All right, now where's the value added? You have a system, hopefully we can build them cheaply and in quantity. Where does the data go? <laughs> okay, from the beginning, we wanted this to be a cloud-based system with automatic synchronization to the cloud. We wanted to be agnostic as to which cloud service we use. Different end users may have different requirements. They may have a specified one that they can access and others they can't. So we started thinking about this, in, in like if you're familiar with something like Amazon Web Services, one of them, that you build a virtual machine. Ultimately, it's a real processors and resources and memory, but it's a virtual machine that's called an instance. You configure it in a particular way. And you can have another instance that's configured identically or differently, but it's basically running the same software, the same process. So you can have firewalled instances. And we can aggregate our data into any number of commercial web services like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services. Then inside of that instance, we have this environment we just call MT Monitor. And first of all, first step, get your data there to the cloud. You have to do it in a way that's robust, that's high availability in case something fails in the server cloud, it falls back and you don't lose anything or you quickly recover it. And for some applications, where the data flows is geolocated. In other words, you may have a client in Russia, and they have a uh, requirement that the data can't leave Russian servers. So you have to use a cloud service configured to allow data flow only there. You may have an oil company. And again, they're going to specify where their data has to go. So you will implement a custom instance that channels the data the right way and ultimately is balancing the loads in some automated way and goes to high availability physical clusters in this cloud service. Um, and again, to satisfy a number of requirements, the data have to be encrypted end to end. You have to have a way of provisioning credentials so people have rights to access the data using industry standards with defined roles and responsibilities. And it, this goes right now into a SQL database uh, as our basic data management method. So again, you have different instances, cloud-based instances. Data is flowing into them. You can have any number of them. You could have ones for commercial clients with special requirements for academic clients that are totally open. These instances can handle lots of things, data aggregation, archival, processing, inversion and interpretation. They're all different layers of this uh, system. It's an onion shell model tailored to the requirements of the end user. You may have a very experienced end user. Many people on this call would be able to take this all the way through inversion and interpretation and not need any of these services after you get the data aggregation and, and storage. Others may be new to MT and they need a lot of this done for them. So the goal is, to provide as many shells, layers as possible, and to make the process as automated as possible, basically a, a semi-robotic process that's cloud-based. So the, the core layer, data ingestion and instrument control, you receive your IOMT data from your device. In this case, the Dart 1.0. You validate that the transmission was accurate. You ensure that the device is operating properly, it's be behaved within specifications. And shortly, we'll have the ability to terminate and start new runs with uh, new configurations remotely. Right now, it's done by field crews and person on site. The data transmission is block-oriented, uh, secure, 
there's a header. The header provides a timestamp. Uh, and then what I'll call a hotel load of relevant data, like different parts of uh, the system's temperatures, battery voltages. We've recently um, ordered uh, a first of a, a large set of a lithium iron phosphate batteries that come with a very sophisticated Bluetooth interface that give us all sorts of useful information about the state of the battery, the state of charge, what time is left on it, et cetera. Eventually we hope to integrate that into the, the Dart as well. Then you have a data block um, and then something that lets you validate the data uh, were correct and transmitted successfully. And the typical cadence, think of it uh, for long period MT of something like once a minute, we'll get a data block. Uh, the blocks then are assembled uh, into a file locally inside the Dart onto a high capacity, high speed micro SD card. Again, that's your fail safe in case everything fails. Uh, so you have data files. Blocks are sent to the servers through this LTE or Starlink or equivalent backhaul. The server validates the data. If there's a problem and the validation fails, there's a retransmit algorithm. And eventually, you know, the data makes it to the server if all is working well. And if blocks are transmitted out of sequence because some got there successfully the first time but others took multiple transmits, then because we have metadata in the header, we can reassemble the correct chronological order of the blocks. Um, now, if you have a total failure of the LTE um, for a long time, it's not a problem because over time, once communications are reestablished, the, the missing packets will trickle back into the cloud and be reassembled. And uh, then that just stops the, the server side will interrogate the Dart and say, can you hear me? Do you have any packets? And if that fails, you know you've got a real problem. Time to get a fuel crew out there when convenient and see what's going on. Okay. And things you can do remotely, you can look at the time series because it's in the cloud. It's always in the cloud. You can look at it, see what's going on. Probably important to look at time series, folks. Really, you, you learn amazing things. So don't just go with semi-automated processing. That should be part of your loop. Uh, you can generate uh, transfer functions. Uh, what we've done so far is we've taken, because we've been using kind of the now classical robust, you know, uh, Egbert and Eisel algorithms and codes for these many years of the MT array, the first set of algorithms we decided to recode into a, our own Python code base was, was those algorithms. That's the, not going to be the only ones we use. We wanted to show consistency and uh, interoperability with existing uh, results. So we're doing that. Um, I know Carl Kapler has got his own project doing um, an open source version of that. Because we're working not only in a, an academic, but also a commercial space, we need an independent code base. Um, and also we want to extend it past that. So we have our own. Um, we have, I don't have time to show you a live demo, but we have this web interface right now, very simple called MT Monitor. If a station is telemetering, uh, the station run ID appears and we can open it up and we can download the data from the cloud locally. We can do processing. We can look at the time series and we can look at the response functions. Um, then the other layers, once you have response functions, if the client or end user needs them and not just the time series, uh, we don't want to need, need more layers that we're developing as cloud-based software as a service. Uh, we're big users of uh, MacBell Egbert, Egbert's, uh, Kelbert's uh, uh, MADIM for 3D inversion, uh, but we're, we've also been developing new inversions. And so I have a postdoc at Sally 2 who's currently developing a new um, combined joint MT, CSEM, other method, adjoint uh, inversion that uses uh, uh, GPUs very effectively for, for very impressive acceleration. And using GPUs, it's a, it's a both time and frequency domain code. Using GPUs, you can reduce the computational demands and lower cost and lower time. So uh, he's, he's well on the way with his code. It's looking, looking good. So this is a, a layer in, in, in this cloud uh, software. And then ultimately interpretation. If you have, a, a, say, a new, new client naive to MT, needs help with the interpretation, that can involve both human and uh, AI uh, shells. So that's the idea. Our hardware um, cost 
target, well, ideally zero, you wanna make the hardware free, all the values in the data, not the hardware, the values in the interpretation of the data. That's what the client cares about. That's what the end user cares about. You want an inkjet printer model where the printer is practically free and all the expenses and the value added, those nasty little cartridges, right? It's the data. So we try to make the hardware as inexpensive as possible. Now, this is an early, early run of an early system. It's gonna be the most expensive it'll ever be. Uh, and it gets cheaper from here when you go into production. So our target for commercial customers is less than $5,000 for a complete integrated MT system for, for long period with telemetry capable in future of wideband by addition of coils. Uh, this is not the academic pricing, which would be substantially less. Uh, that's the hardware side. On the data flow software side, the IO MT cloud, the cost of that depends on the service required. But if you're using LTE for telemetry and your costs are sub $15 a month per system, that's negligible. Then you're looking at what services you need for remote instrument control for archival storage. Is this going into a national data archive or is it being archived in, in the cloud in one of these cloud services? Um, and we're developing a system that will be suitable for archiving using some ideas I'm not free to talk about yet, but I think it'll be really kind of interesting. And so we're targeting a less than $200 a month base cost for a commercial user to have these services. And then the other service layers, including validation of uh, licensing for access to the data, attribution of the data source, and the response function processing version interpretation. So in summary, the point here is to develop the maximum efficiency through situational awareness in your field operations and keep things safe and know what your crews are doing and have structured reporting and make sure the metadata is always done a certain way and get information every day and have channels of communication direct to people on the ground for problem reporting. Use the lowest cost hardware, software, and telemetry you can engineer. Use nested cloud-based services. And if you can do all that, we have conditions ready for wider acceptance of MT by a community that may not really know the method and they need help getting started. So I'll stop here. I know it's a massively long talk. Uh, the DART system was developed, you know, as I say, nights and weekends by two little limited liability companies, corporations, uh, Brady Fry's Chainus Research and Engineering, my own Enthalpian Energy, LLC, and the data we're showing and some of the process results from things like MTRA were all provided and also this um, system for um, uh, predicting power flow through the power grid from geomagnetically induced currents. Uh, it's all done under National Science Foundation support, US Geological Survey support, NASA support, and other NSF agreements and subawards through IRS incorporated research institutions for seismology. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions if anyone's still here. Thank you very much, Adam. That was very interesting. And I think, yeah, a lot of sort of important topics uh, regarding, well, access to data, how we acquire data and how we can improve things. And yeah, I can I, I can tell you, I think you broke the uh, standing record for longest talk in the EMINA so far. I think you um, exceeded that golden mode talk by about 10 minutes. That was my goal. That was my stated goal, Ellen yeah. Jones, that I was going to go longer than Doug. We already have a few questions. Um, so the first one by, well, there are two by Rob G. In the underwater measurement, so this goes back to sort of, I think the, the middle of your talk, you measure three components of electric. What significance is the vertical electric? Have you done that for ground-based work? And if not, why not? Good question. Um, no, not for, not for terrestrial work, only for marine work. There are a couple of applications where we have support from the Department of Energy and National Energy Technology Laboratory to develop a new marine controlled source EM source that is suitable not only for the kind of thin, uh, uh, buried, sub-horizontal um, oil and gas reservoir work everyone's familiar with in marine controlled source EM, but actually for um, geohazards, related work, looking at things like 
uh, gas pipes breaking out of salt domes that could become geohazards or uh, other hazards where your target might be vertical or subvertical in very small aspect ratio. And we are finding advantages uh, in having all six components of the E and B fields. And also um, for this powerful new signal source um, is important to that, but also uh, it turns out it's an interesting physical oceanographic measurement for looking at barotropic currents in, in the water column. Uh, and that is a noise source for EM. So it's, it's an easy measurement to add. It, it costs practically nothing to do. So we do all, all six. Yeah, it's easy I, uh, in the marine environment, but of course very yeah. difficult in the, on, on land, yes. Yep. Uh, second question, any data examples of the sub-aerial coil deployments or any comparisons? Well, not in today's talk, but absolutely. Um, we've done this a fair amount and also other people have started adopting it. We provided them our clamps and coils. Um, we find that in the, uh, uh, there's a frequency band where we see roughly a three decibel uh, deterioration in signal to noise level uh, versus a conventional deployment. But uh, I'm very conservative about wideband. I tend to stay on site longer. Um, even if I'm going to a kilohertz, I generally, if I can afford it, like to spend two days on a site and catch a couple of big cycles. So uh, we found that practically we're able to get pretty good results with sub aerial. And I'll tell you, if you're facing, say, a, uh, an agency or a landowner that's not going to let you go there if you dig a hole, uh, that data is a lot better than nothing. And oh, yeah. that yellow, yeah, and that Yellowstone, 50% of our sites were subaerial. We couldn't get there any other way. And it lets us go to places like, you know, national parks and national monuments and do MT when you can't otherwise. Yeah, and of course, there's also the situation, yes, where you may be allowed to dig, but you can't really dig because you're on sort of bedrock nearly immediately, yes. Um, right. So, yeah, and there is a variety of applications there. Um, and then Peter Wolfgram is asking about flux field orthogonality. Have you compared, calculate the calculated total field against, um, I think that's a cesium mag? Cesium magnetism, yeah. Yeah, and how, uh, well, did I agree? No. I have not done that one. Um, I don't have a cesium magnetometer. And this is uh, two guys at night and weekends with no budget, basically, you know, trying to do this. Um, but we have compared against our existing flux gates uh, in the lab setting. We have a compact uh, Faraday shield that we have a, a, a solenoid wound around with a signal source. And we can calibrate uh, magnetic field components that way. And then we do field deployments as well. And then we actually look at the devices through the tomography. So it's a, it's a roundabout way. Um, I'm actually at this stage of the game, trusting the manufacturers are actually not lying about their, their response. And then I go out in the field. Um, anything we do, for example, if I wanted to deploy one of the darts, in the MT array where USGS wants to see an all NIMS deployment, the only way I'll ever be able to convince them I can do that and maybe at a location where the NIMS just can't be deployed because of certain conditions is if I can show intercalibration between the NIMS, the response of a dart and a response of a NIMS is identical. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, fingers crossed, we'll be able to fill in some holes in the, in the grid that the NIMS just aren't suitable for because of whatever the limitation is. Yeah. Oh, and just another question coming in. So from Jan, from Jan Avram, so great talk. The IOMT is definitely the way our community must adopt. We all want MT to be cheaper, but when it comes to commercial operations, we still acquire 14 hours of data to reach the 100 second target. In your opinion, shouldn't we also be looking at more efficient processing code to extract the information we want out of measurement durations of a couple of hours or so. Oh yeah, obviously, I, I agree entirely. I mean, first of all, when you're going from flux gates say, to coils and you have wideband coils, obviously use the best coils. You know, we have some opinions about uh, what coils do what at what frequencies. I, Iris did a big comparison of different coils. I'm not gonna spill the beans on uh, which we thought were the best coils. Um, so you have, you have good coils, you, um, you know, are benefiting at long periods from the fact that the solar cycle that is emerging 
is way more active than the prediction. We're, we're able to complete stations faster because of that than we thought we would. So, you know, the sun is kicking up uh, a lot, but yeah, the algorithms that we're using initially for some of these uh, service layers, they're not the latest algorithms. We're using them because they're established and we can compare them against the processing done at thousands of sites. It's not the end game. Uh, for a while, I had a, a postdoc from Japan, Naoto Umamura, and we were working in machine learning as an adjunct to uh, uh, empty processing. Uh, and we're developing some interesting ideas I took forward with another postdoc, Rolando Carbonaro, uh, and he uh, and I have some interesting preliminary results using ML um, for this. Uh, that we have a, a preprint we're working on. So I think there are some advances, certainly over the last 30 years and in, in, in recent decades, that will definitely squeeze more uh, juicy information out of our, our somewhat noisy data at the long frequency band, absolutely. And, and you know, there are people who will be doing this for open source. Unfortunately, the way we're doing it, we really can't go that way easily unless we have an instance that's exclusively for academic use and we have a, a diver, diverging code base. So that's an awkward issue. And I'm not sure how we, we deal with it. Okay. And another one from Denno Peters. For your sub area systems, have you had any issues with animal or human disturbance? Yeah, that's a good question because if you work in the rural American uh, backcountry, you very much worry about human and animal disturbance, um, which is a perpetual issue. Um, not really though, funny enough, the subaerial deployments we've done so far, not really. I had only one site at Mount St. Helens. It was kind of a ledge off the side of a road, off the side of the blast zone that turned out to be a location where elk hunters like to shoot these elk and drag their bodies. And they like dragging them right over our coils, you know. So that was an exceptional circumstance. But other than that one, I don't think we really have had an issue with that. Uh, we have had uh, issues with, you know, if it's going to be windy, we we build these non-magnetic tents to prevent the coils from vibrating, and they're visible. So you got to be careful. There's some locations you just can't do that because, you know, the the forest ranger is going to object that somebody at a campsite can see it or you're nervous that somebody sees it, right? Uh, and you can only camouflage things so well. So that is a, a valid concern, but no, we, we've been lucky so far. And then I gotta tell you 15 years, uh, 16 years of conventional MTRA NIMS installations over, I don't know how many sites now, 1500. So we've had only one stolen system and we've had maybe seven or eight aggressive vandalization acts. It's, a, it's amazing to me, really. It's amazing to me. So we've been pretty lucky. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, most people are reasonably sen uh, sensible, yes, when they see this. They might be curious and disturbed, but not necessarily sort of- In <laughs> Germany, <laughs> when, when our equipment says property of the US government, you might as well paint a bullseye on it. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. It's certainly in some parts. Okay, um, there are no current open questions. So given the advanced time, I think we'll leave it at this, but yeah, feel free to, um, okay, the last one, quick one. Oh, no, two. Oh, now they're coming. <laughs> okay. Keep them coming. Keep so, them coming. Um, Jan Avram again, despite the call, go ahead power consumption, we adopted BeagleBoard in our systems to support our IOMT. Do you think the MicroPython will support the DART with induction sensors? Yes, Jan, as I said in my talk. Um, so we, we've implemented the FPGA uh, and the ADCs we're using go up to 38 uh, kilosamples per second per channel. And while we haven't proven jitter-free data acquisition yet uh, at that level, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to be getting up well, well into the kilohertz band uh, because of the FPGA. So it's MicroPython plus FPGA. So yes. 
And then chat wise, what is the added burden in, cost, in terms of cost of time of deploying electrode payouts for MT? Are there any technologies on the horizon for reducing this cost? Solid state devices? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question, actually. It's a very difficult question. Uh, oh, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, there are certainly capacitive devices out there you can get, and you can use buffer amplifiers and all of that. But the problem is that long periods, uh, if you're really pushing the long period MT and you have aspirations of hitting 10,000 second periods or longer, not so much. So we're still in kind of electrolytic coupling to the ground. Now there are commercial electrodes. There are the types we build. We build a dual chamber gel style electrode. We built actually, we had 3000 uh, electrode shells, uh, custom injection molded in China with a custom uh, polymer alloy, you know, all optimized to make assembly quick and efficient and disassembly and repair very quick. Uh, there are commercial electrodes that use solid state electrodes that also work very well. Um, and we're actually experimenting with a, a new version of that. And that may help speed up some of the deployments. You still need to dig a hole, but it might be as simple as popping it in the ground, getting some local mud on it and covering it. So, you know, and, and having it stable for, for weeks. So uh, other than that, I, I'm short of ideas, to be honest. I, I played around with, again, for high frequencies, some, some more uh, no contact capacitive designs. But again, getting to those long periods is really a, a problem. Well, and I mean, I would say from my experience, right, that at least certainly in terms of time, it's the fact that you have to bury them sort of 100 meters apart. Yes, and you have, some of them have to bushwhack or, align them yeah you know digging the hole for the electrode is is sort of a, a part of it but not all of it yes yeah and that's a good point i'm glad you mentioned it i mean uh, at, at better times in the solar cycle we shorten our lines uh, as much uh, as down to 30 meters which makes sighting and locating really fast and use lasers and you know, range finders um uh, and that can work well uh, we've experimented with reducing noise uh, actually with shielded cables and shielded electrodes, which is hard to do. Uh, but fundamentally, yeah, you're getting electrodes in the ground. You have some length of dipole. You have to orient them quickly. There are uh, like differential uh, GTK GPS devices that allow you to walk out to the electro location very quickly if you want to spend the money. Um, so yeah, there are ways of doing it. If you're doing production work, you might want to do it that way and not have a tape measure and a sighting compass and, and do it the old school way. Okay, I'm going to make this the last question because I also, you know, it's dinner time in Germany. Um, what is the service life of your custom made electrodes? Well, I'll tell you what our design goal is. And keep in mind, these electrodes are used very hard. I mean, they're in the ground, they're out of the ground, they're in the ground, they're, they're changing uh, environments every day, practically, every time they move to a new site. Um, our, our service life goal without maintenance is three years. We achieved that with our older Series 2 design. We haven't yet achieved it with the Series 4 design, which is uh, which has moved to this um, injection molded shell design, which is much easier to maintain and, and re replenish. And it's in that sense, more environmentally green. And it turns out we had a problem with a, a, a tolerance in a, in a part that led to a compromised seal in some cases, and that was letting the electro dry out. We think we fixed that. So I'm hoping now we will be able to demonstrate that three-year service life again. But again, at the end of the service life, these electrodes are designed so you simply replace the gel and close them up again. We've also developed a way of doing a field repair of the interior of the electrodes so the, the crews can basically rehydrate them in case there was a compromise seal and they dried out prematurely. But that's our goal, three years. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for answering all those questions. So yes, I'm gonna close this now and just re want to remind you next week, we have Roman, Romain Cosseri on 3D magnetophilic image of a hyperextended and serpentized rift system in the southwest Barents Sea margin. So, um, some images of the subsurface. So, thanks, Adam, and thank you everyone for attending, and hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Scott. <laughs> Bye.